Hey, y'all. How's it going? I'm Kyle Filson, <laughs> and sitting with me, the man, the myth, the legend, Cameron Hale, the big hunter, Fred Bear. What's up, players? Is here. We're going to do another episode of OTC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about all types of things, uh, all kinds of things from giant uh, sloths to missing planes to ginormous pigs. Yukon beaver or, eaters. Yeah, Yukon beaver eaters. All types of things. Um Let's start off with the big the big hunting news. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Cam has been keeping track of these hogs. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've the, my allergies and my cough is up, and uh, I can't seem to shake it. But uh, you know, Texas, we have a feral hog problem. That's pretty and mild, uh, for man. those that don't know, and, and yeah, I mean, they're literally the whole state is covered with these things, and they just multiply. I think pigs can have three to four litters a year, uh, and each one of those litters can be up to fifteen piglets. And they become sexually active very early. Four months at four months of age, three to four months of age. So, I mean, these things breed like wildfire. So, like when we were kids, there was only every once in a while you would hear somebody yeah. that had a wild hog on their place. It I was like you could watch almost like a storm front moving very, very slow. You could, we heard it out west and we heard it down south. And then it would we be didn't a have couple fire of years later. Either. Same thing, yeah. right? A couple of years later, they'd be a little closer, a couple of counties closer, a couple of counties closer. And then all of a sudden, they I mean, just roll across like a, a wave. Right. So, like, if you're not a hunter and you're not familiar, each state has its own fish and, and game uh, offices, and they determine based on the county and the and the size populations of the animals that are that you can hunt or harvest uh, what the restrictions are. So, some some states and some counties have more deer that you can harvest or less. It's all based on the population, the census. I don't know how they go about doing this, but they do it, and. Uh, but uh, so like the county we live in right now is a two buck, two doe county. When I was a kid, it was like a one buck, one doe county. But it fluctuates, so it may be different in five years. But anyways, this is for all types of game. The wild hogs, though, there's no limit. All you need is a hunting license. You can kill them as many of you as you want. Any way you want. Any way you want. They don't care because they're out of control. And you're like, well, you know, why... Why, you know, what what harm do they do? Well, they tear up a lot of ranchers' fence lines. They, they, they cause all kinds of problems. They will literally destroy a, a crop. Like if you're trying to grow, say, corn. Well, that stuff, if you have a field and say you have a 50-acre plot of land and you're trying to harvest corn on there, well, a, a bunch of feral hogs, they will come in and destroy that crop. Yeah. All of it. And you're talking, I mean, these are some of the people's livelihoods. Any kind of garden you have, that's toast. If these things get around there, well, then they root holes and then cows step in the holes and they break their legs. So now you're losing livestock, you're losing your, your crops. So they're, they're a nuisance. And lots of people look, don't, don't kill them. They trap them. A lot of people trap them. Then they take them to slaughter, just like you would a farm pig. Yep. And they, they either eat, eat the meat themselves or they donate it to the hungry. Uh, a lot of hunters do the same thing. They will kill the hogs and then take them and donate the meat to feed the hungry. These are all good things. I've had wild hog, uh, it's not as good as a farm raised pig. It's just not. It's no, tougher. It's, it's yeah, it's, but it's not, too lean. And it's too lean, you know. Uh, but I know that I have a buddy of mine and he he swears by him. He smokes briskets all the time with only wild hog. And he he has a way of I think he brines them for a while. There's That's, there's yeah. there's things you can do to make mm. it a lot more tender, but uh they're everywhere. Anyways, flash forward, I don't even know why I got into this because I guess there's a lot of people listening that may not be hunters. But so Cam's lease has hogs on it. And he's been keeping track of this one. And if you follow Cam on Instagram, he's been posting pictures over the last two or three weeks. Uh, there they are again. There's the one I want. He didn't come in quite I've been going to battle so with this good. Sucker. Oh, he came in. I think even one day Cam missed. I missed him at 33 yards with my recurve. Yeah, I shot right under him. He called me all depressed the oh, next day. So he's like, man, I missed him. Well, that was also like a couple twice. of days after uh, he winded me. I had set up in another spot, and he came in, and then he winded me, and I couldn't get a shot at him, which means he come downwind of the way my scent was blowing and smelled me before I could get a shot and moved on off. And then a few days later, he comes in, and I missed him, which was funny because I had missed another one. It was a, there was like 12 of them come in, and I missed the one I wanted to shoot, and then I didn't even know he was out there with this group because usually when those boars get to a certain size, they become rogue. They go off by themselves. They don't spend a lot of time with the groups. They only come in when sows go into heat. And but he was with him, and I, he appeared, and I was like, "Woohoo!" And I sent a sharp stick his way, and did not even come close. It was like six inches yeah. under his under him, and hitting the dirt. So yeah, he and I had been uh, wrestling back and forth, trying to I'm trying to to seal the deal on him. Uh, when I hunted in Seymour, 
we had a real problem with hogs on that place. We hunted on 3,800 acres up there, and it was real rough and a lot of canyons and a creek ran through it. And I mean, it was some rough country. And uh, the guy that run cattle on there had a problem with, like whenever the, the, the old heifers would go into uh, calving season and the calves would start hitting the ground. Of course, coyotes show up because they can smell, of course, the afterbirth and all that. And they, they smell. So if the calves don't get up and get to moving around and whatnot, of course, the coyotes can get them too. But pigs will do the same thing. Pigs will come up and actually oh, eat yeah. the calves and all that stuff. Well, we've had calves on my lease now that I'm on here. And I hadn't seen them out in that area, but I had found tracks of them out in the area that's kind of open more where the cattle would stay and all this stuff. So I was wondering, I'm like, well, I wonder if he's going to start causing a problem. But so here's the story, as Kyle alluded to. So I've been after this this sucker, and he's big. He's a big, a big boar. And uh, I had actually seen pictures of him, I believe it was back in September of last year, I posted a picture of him come in. And I, I'd only seen him one other time last year, and that was it. So I saw him once on a picture, once in the reel at about 75 yards, and then nothing. And I didn't even know he was still out there until the end of February, and I saw a picture of him again. And they have been trapping pigs off of our lease. So I think that it kind of shook him up a little bit, and I figured he was gone. And then when I saw that picture towards the end of February, I'm like, ooh, he's still here. Let's see what happens. So I had set up for him. And then he and I went to battle trying for me to try to catch him slipping. And finally, like I said, that's what happened. I went out there. I had soured some corn, and I knew where they were coming out to, and they are coming to this certain area, and I had my feeder going and had it set up for pigs, and I've been putting a bunch of stuff out. I'm like, when they come in, I'm getting rid of them. So I had dumped this corn out. Sure enough, there's about 10 or 12 pigs come in. He comes in. And he just starts bullying all the little pigs, and he goes right in the middle of this soured corn that I had poured out, and I didn't miss him this time. And I I put one right in the boiler room, and, <laughs> and he took off. He didn't go far. I think he went 50 or 60 yards. Now, for everybody out there, too, mind you, Cam's using a stick bow, which yeah. is just a recurve, a Black Widow stick bow, yeah. traditional archery. It's about the hardest way other than using a, a addle addle or a spear to yeah. kill them. Yeah. It's and you didn't just get him, pounder. you got two of his buddies all in the yeah. same sitting. Yeah, I ended up shooting three that night I, I uh, or that evening. Yeah, the, the I have a recurve. There's no sight. There's no anything on it. It's just a piece of wood and a string, and you pull it back and bend it. And like I said, most of y'all listening to, I had harvested a whitetail last year with a longbow during deer season. And then I got this recurve, and I was like, woohoo! And then so, yeah, I shot him, and he ran off. And the, the, those bows are so quiet, and the pigs didn't do anything. Uh, there was another couple of little ones come in. I'd say 45, 50 pounders come in. I shot both of those. I shot one of those. It ran off and fell over. I shot the other one. It ran off, gathered them up, kept them, took the big one, got lucky because we took the photos of it, but the guy that traps hogs ended up taking that hog, so I didn't have to worry about even taking it because you got to be real careful with those big ones because – they're not the best eating those big nasty pigs. No, and I don't know how to look. I've cooked them before, yeah, slow cooking them like we're talking about. But when you get to that boar size, the best way that I've always been told to do it, and luckily knew a guy that took him to do it, was they make sausage out of them. They do. He does some kind of thing where he'll blend him like the pork sausage, and I don't know what all he blends. And he it looked with. the boar because um, you see the photographs on Instagram. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm the cameraman. Um, he looked about three or four years old to yeah. me. Yeah, and. That's uh that's pretty good because I think wild boar on average uh, four is a mature one. They very rarely live past eight years old. Is they, that like their max? I guess max is like for like a pet pig, like somebody has a pet. Oh yeah, pig, they'll live fifteen years. Yeah, that's my son's pig scooter. He may be fifteen or twenty by the time he gets. Yeah, but fifteen, in the wild, eighteen, but yeah, wild. They say eight is if you max. see a seven year old boar, that's an old one. Yeah, you know what? You're probably right. He's probably about middle age. I think he's I about three him. or four. Here's the wild thing is. The big tusks that they have, he didn't have them. He had broken all of them off but one in a fight, and his left ear looked like you had split it with a knife. He had been in a yeah, fight. And, and that's I, exactly why their lifespan is so short. Is those battle. things fight all the time. Oh, yeah. And they, it sounds like monsters in the woods when they fight. Oh, it's no joke. Like, when it's, it's dark. not cool. I've been in ground blinds, and it's dark still, and you can hear them, and you can hear them chomping their teeth, and mm -hmm. it, you can't see them. 
but you, you know, it's like a monster's 20 yards from you, and you're like, <laughs> oh, please, Jesus, don't come in here. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're like, really, what am I going to do? Yeah, it, it, It's uh, like, the, I mean, you know how tough those things are? You can hit them with a bat. It's not going to do, do anything. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything. No. You've already told the story of you having your battle with one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was the first battle I had with one. I've actually had a couple of them chase me, and I've gotten into a fight with them. If you're uh, following on Instagram, you've seen the hog. It's ginormous. If you If you don't follow Cam, you should check it out. Uh, on Instagram, uh, it's a it's a big boar, man. He's he's really yeah. Big. He's a big pig. And, and what's wild is I have a picture, and I believe I posted it up that I have had five photographs with that boar that I shot with another boar that's in there, and I've never seen the other one. And he makes the one I shot look like a baby. Oh god! So I don't know. Now look, you'll hear these stories of giant pigs. hogzilla, right? Yeah, these giant hogs, and a lot of them are barred hogs that have been cut. They have been castrated and then been released, and so it makes them get real fat. And lots of times they were almost like pen raised before they let them go and let somebody shoot them, so they could say they killed a big pig. But y'all have to imagine, uh, listening of us talking all these cryptid animals, you have to imagine the same as a dog. A dog gets fat because it's kept by people. If you look at a wild dog or dogs that you see running around on the street, strays, like yeah. strays, or even look at coyotes, they don't get huge because they just, in the wild, it's not functional size. That's why I always, every time you see a picture or a photograph of a hogzilla or some ginormous 1,000-pound mm -hmm. pig, I'm always like, dude, there's no way. Because it's just not enough protein for them to eat to get that size. Well, they have to move too much. You'll burn off that much weight looking for more food to eat. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right. And also, if you look at the photographs, the guys oftentimes will step back yeah. really far behind the kill, the hog, so it looks like it's bigger than it is. Yeah. I'm sitting directly behind my You're pig. sitting on it. Yeah, just right knees up underneath it, sitting there where you can take a look at it. I have seen some big ones killed. There was We killed one uh, in Seymour that weighed a buddy of mine that weighed a little over 400 pounds, like 406 pounds, I think is what it weighed. Jeez. But there's a caveat to that. He was he was a wild hog, legit straight up wild hog. But there was a a lot of uh, like creek feeders up there, so a lot of protein feed for the cattle. Uh, so it yeah, was that's exactly they what. were getting into a lot of that. So it was one of those deals. The pigs up there actually had fat on them, like it was they knew where to go get it, and they would go eat. So they were very very healthy pigs. This one he was healthy, but there wasn't an ounce of fat on him. Like there's, I mean, he's just muscle and gristle. And you're like, all right, dude, you can grind him up if you want, but I do not. And that's another thing. In the state of Texas with hogs, there's no want and waste law. You don't have to remove them from the field as far as I'm aware. The, the, I need to look into it to make sure. We always take them and do something with them. Donate the Somebody, meat usually. Exactly. Yeah. Somebody takes them and, and does something with them. I do know I have cooked them the roast and slow cooked them in butter, grass-fed butter in like a crock pot or something. If you slow cook them, season them and slow after you brine them, yeah. slow cook them with a lot of fat, natural fat in there. They turn out good, but it takes a lot of work to make it to where you're well, not you getting just bacon it. off of them. No, 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 no. I mean, no, it's just no. not going to happen. No, but it was like really hunting a monster. But I wanted him out of there. And the silly reason for the main part is because I don't want to take a chance encounter with him. You don't want to walk up on one. No. If I'm out there whitetail hunting, I don't want to just, I don't mind little pigs, but you don't want to have a dealing with a monster like that because. There's all kinds of people I've known that's been attacked by them, been hunting them, you know, and and like I've known guys that have tried to hunt them with dogs and they turn on them whenever the dogs get on them. Like yeah. if they get you down, you're in trouble. They're going to put a hurt on you. And let's just say one of those tusks, one of those cutters catch you on the inside of the thigh and clip a femoral artery. Well, then what? Well, now you're dead. Yeah. And I was laying in it's bed over. that night. Um, I had photographed that you and your hog and then we had driven to McKinney for a baseball tournament. We were staying at a hotel. And as I was laying down, because I was bored, there wasn't really anything to do after we were done with our games. And I was thinking about the story you were talking about, the Sasquatch when the kid said there was people in the woods. Yeah. And it was throwing the pig. Yeah. Now, can you imagine trying to throw that hog? If something threw I mean, that, you, I you, would never go to the woods again. I couldn't even pick that. I couldn't even pick it up, first of all. I couldn't pick it up. No, no. It took three of us to, to untrack it, to start dragging it. I mean, it took, I could physically drag it, but there's no way I could just pick no, it up. No, no, no. I don't think you and I together could pick it up. I definitely couldn't pick it up and throw it. No. We might be able to get it up off the ground and like shuffle foot it like you're moving furniture. Yeah, yeah. But as far as like we would have to one, two, three swing it to throw it maybe three feet. Maybe. Yeah, why does stuff always seem heavier when it's like dead weight? Like you got I don't a person. Know. Like if I picked you up, I could pick you up. But if you were just like passed out. Instantly, you like another 40 pounds. It's just like you're holding a bag full of water. You're like, I just, I can't, con yeah. 
So yeah, it was. It turned out to be a really a really interesting hunt. I'm glad I got him. Uh, the others and, are, are going to be great. They're going on the smoker this weekend. Uh, and I was going to say, <laughs> I've been hunting with archery my whole life. So is Cam. That's how we've talked about it before. That's how we met. Is when in middle school. Yeah, we were the only two archers. But I've always used a compound bow my entire life. Well, all the fun he's been having, <laughs> I converted him. I was like, dude, I need to get me a stick bow. <laughs> So I finally got one. I got this Canadian uh, brand uh, called Checkmate. Yep, and it's a handmade stick bow. Um, I don't think the biz- I don't think the company's in business anymore. Maybe they are. I don't. I don't remember the story. But uh, well, I'll tell you all the story behind the bows. Uh, I bought mine used, and the same guy that Kyle bought his from is a retired pastor that lived in Alaska for thirty years. Moved back to Texas in two thousand and six. He's probably. How do you think he's probably 70 now? Yeah, I was going to say, 70, I'd say 70 to 73. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere around in there. And the re- he's got, had, he had 67 traditional bows in his house. And his wife talked him into starting to sell some off because he can't shoot them anymore. He's like, he has a few he can shoot. Physically, he can't. So he she talked him into letting other people enjoy them. So he went to selling them off. So when I went and bought mine, it's one of those deals when, it's like anything else. If you're into something, somebody else is into something, and y'all start talking, you're out there for, I was supposed to be in and out in 15 minutes. I was there for two and a half hours. Kyle ended up getting caught for over an hour out there just yeah. sitting there talking. Oh, like, gosh. You you just can't, but I mean, it's, it's one of those just a, things. It's a, a bored old man. He wanted to talk. And he's <clears throat> a wealth of traditional knowledge. He sent me a message just the other day, and he told me to tell your, told me to tell my friend to buy the other bow he's selling. Because he's got one that's like a 46 pound. Yeah, the checkmate. I need to get that one. Yeah, that he said, be- tell your friend to buy that other bow. And I was like, <laughs> I'll tell back. him. Did you ever send him the photo of the haul? No, I need to send him one because he wanted one. I need to go ahead and send it to him. I forgot, but I will. When we get done recording, I'll send him a message of that pig. Yeah, because uh, that's one of the things he made me promise him to send him a photograph of yep. the first thing yep. I take, I harvest. And I'm it. done with the compounds. I got rid of all of them, and I know you will too. Once you, once you get I don't know. To I'm, going, I don't, I'm not jumping off this ship yet. I still love my compound yeah. bow, but uh, it'll happen. I am going to uh, get into traditional archery. I remember my father had a bow just like the one I have. It wasn't a checkmate, but I mean, his was a bear. But I just remember looking at that recurve as a kid all the time. And uh, so it's weird that here I am all those years Full later. Circle. And you know, I'm attempting to shoot the same t- type of uh, bow that my father shot. So I, I showed my dad and he was pretty He was pretty pumped about it. I think I'm going to do some. I'll do, I'll do a story. I'll, I'll tell the story coming up. I'll tell the story of Ishii and of Saxton Pope and then get into the stories of, of uh, Bill Compton, William Compton. I'll get into the stories of some of the, the – the whole story with Ishii is a very, very – he was what's known as the last – they called him the last wild Indian because oh, yeah. he was found in California and all and, this stuff. So, yeah, I'll get into the story about how Ishii taught Saxton Pope and some of these guys and some of the other – and. For those of you that are into archery, there is a, a a record book club of and I don't Kyle and I don't keep up with trophy size animals. We don't care, but a lot of people do, and they they go off a of measurement. And it was formed by Doctor Saxton Pope, and yeah, and and Mister yeah. Young. So, and I'm not hating on uh, rifle hunters. That's not what I'm doing. No, no, no. I don't no. I don't hate on rifle hunters. A lot of people like to hunt that way, and and good good for you. You like to do it. I, I just, just enjoy pref- the other. I just prefer the other one more. I want it to be as hard as possible. Um, well, that's another thing. I mean, rifle hunting, you know it's not that hard because nine-year-old kids do it. Yeah, I, I wanted that challenge for myself, and it's something that in order to be uh, decent with, I say decent, in order to be decent, of course, with one, not really good. I don't know if you ever get good, but you just get better than others. You have to dedicate time, a little time to that bow, that traditional bow, every day. It's something that's kind of like a, a flower or kind of like a woman. You have to... Give your loved one a little attention every day. That's the way a relationship works, and it's the same with that bow, is you have to give that attention every day in order to stay sharp. Whereas with a compound, like with a rifle, you could shoot it and put it up for a month or two, get it back out, be right back in there. Oh, yeah. It's not a a big deal. I have a 270, and that thing's dialed in. I can literally not even pick it up seven years, pick it up. I'm shooting snuff can groups. Yeah, 300 yards. 400 yards, no problem. You're like, yeah, it's done. As long as nobody hits the scope. It's good. It's the same, yeah. So that's the reason I chose it, is it's just one of those. But, uh, that and also, too, you don't get to harvest as many animals because they have to be close. Real close, I yeah. mean, it's every, everything has to be worked out. So it's one of those deals that I've gotten way, way more humble in my hunting as I've gotten older to where I back way off to where it's more fun 
to just go. And it's just like, if I get a chance, I get, like I said, we're going to Arizona. I'm taking it to Arizona. The idea of running around the mountains with it sounds awesome. The idea of getting something with it's probably not ever going to happen out there, but who knows? I might get lucky. We'll see. I've been trying to get a turkey. The turkey season started March 31st. So I've been, um, I've got a place on yeah. my parents' land. And uh, I saw two on my lease today, two hens. You did? I haven't seen any in two years. No tur- Nobody's seen any turkey. I saw them out in the middle of a little pasture. No, if there's hens, there's going to be toms. I looked and looked and looked. I'm just like, <clears throat> maybe I'll get lucky. Yeah, I don't have a, my brother-in-law's got a spot. I'm supposed to go with him. So we'll find out. Man, that's cool. Well, so, tell me about these plane, missing planes or something. Yeah, yeah this is a pretty cool um, story. Uh, I came upon this a couple weeks ago, and I've just been, I've been meaning to bring it up, and I always forget somehow. Um, everybody likes, on the show, they like stories of time slips, uh, these these time warps, these portals, things like that. And this is actually a case that uh, is something like that. It reminds me of so many other cases of these missing planes, whether it's the missing Malaysian flight uh, that recently happened or the Valentich story. Uh, this was an airliner, and the, and the, the name of it uh, was the Santiago Flight 513. And this plane... What it was, was it's a Lockheed Super Constellation. That's the type of airplane it was. And it we had, go with those damn planes and you again. I always give the uh, yeah the actual model and stuff. But uh, this plane, the flight had 88 passengers. It had four crew members. And the flight was on September 4th, 1954, from Aachen, Germany, to Santiago, Chile, on what was supposed to be just a routine flight. Well, this flight was anything but routine. Um, the plane, it departed at around 8.30 a.m. in Germany. And um, and it was going to take a, oh just over 20 hours to fly all the way to Chile. You have to remember this is a prop engine plane. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a pretty long distance. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know if they were going east or west when they go from Germany to Chile, but that's a long that's a long haul. Um, but the, the thing is, is the plane never made it, okay? Um, it disappeared somewhere over the ocean, and um, they lost radio contact. Well, they lost radio communication with the air traffic controllers, and they never received a mayday signal or anything like that. that just, just gone. At some point, um, they lost contact with the aircraft, and they th- assumed maybe there's some kind of malfunction with the radio that when it gets near uh, Brazil or something coming across South America, they'll be able to, to identify it, they'll be able to see the plane, or they'll be able to reestablish radio connection or something like that. Well, the plane never turned up. Then it never arrived at its destination. It never came in. Mm. So at that point, they knew that there was there was a problem, right? And oh, here I answered my own question. Um, it, it crashed in the Atlantic Ocean, so there I you know go. which way they were going. They were going, they were going west. Um, so they they put together a search party, right? They wanted to try to find this thing. Well, you know, it's a vast ocean, so like you know, it's first you, it's going to be hard to figure out like where are you going to search. Uh, yeah. So they went and searched where they lost radio contact, hoping that maybe that's where it, it ditched. That's where it always, they start right there. Right. So maybe they had, because the idea of it flying for hours without contact doesn't make sense. Right. And so they were able about two days later to establish the search party. And they were hoping that if there were any survivors, maybe they'd be floating around out there in the sea. Well, so they, they contacted a bunch of planes. They contacted a bunch of boats that were already out there. Some of them were on shipping routes. Some of them were actually like naval vessels. They all steered in that direction to search for the wreckage. Well, they found nothing. They didn't find any wreckage. They didn't find any oil slicks. They didn't see any uh, life vest floating. Nothing. They never saw anything. Wow. So at this point, they assumed that everyone was dead, all the passengers were dead, and that the plane must have went down and is probably at the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. Mm-hmm. And the story or the tragedy, whatever, just kind of faded into obscurity. It was just another terrible plane crash at sea. That was until October 12th, 1989. Now remember, this plane departed September 4th, 1954, and it went down on that day. On October 12th, 1989, on what is said was a beautiful sunny day in Port Algier, Brazil, a plane suddenly appeared on their radar. And the radio tower operator called out to the incoming plane to see, you know, identify yourself. It just appeared on radar. They didn't know what it was. They began calling to the aircraft. You know, they wanted it to identify itself, but they got no response. The plane kept approaching the airport. 
and it eventually got to the airport and the plane started circling the airport, they say several times and the air traffic controller continued to call out to the unidentified aircraft. No luck. Complete radio silence. No one's talking to him. Well, after it circled the airport a few more times, the plane went ahead and landed. It landed on the runway and it just came to a halt and sat out there on the tarmac with the engines still idling, just sitting there. So they started to continue to call out to the thing more. No response. So the, the head guy there, the chief is like, look, we got to find out who this guy is. What's he doing? Where'd he come from? What's on the aircraft? You know, is this a drug smuggler? Yeah. Is this a terrorist? Like, what's going on? So they assembled a group of employees, some guys that worked there. I don't know if these guys were baggage handlers, what they were. It doesn't really detail what their jobs were. Uh, maybe they were security guys. I don't know. But they, they assembled this ragtag group. And the ragtag group went out onto the tarmac to approach this plane. Now, the first thing they noticed when they saw the plane is that it was an older-looking prop-driven airplane, even though it looked pristine. I mean, it looked like it was in good condition. Second, they said that it had the Santiago Airlines logo emblazoned on the side of the aircraft, which was odd because Santiago Airlines went bankrupt in 1956. This is getting really, really strange. Yeah. So the team wrote down the plane's number, the airplane number that you see displayed on the wings, right? Yeah. yeah. They called it back to the tower and the, ca- uh, the the air traffic controller went and checked the number, and it was the same plane that departed on September 4th, 1954 from Aachen, Germany. So they're just watching it set out there idling after it circled and landed, and nobody's talking, and they're like, this plane's not supposed to be here. This is the missing plane that crashed over the Atlantic more than three decades prior. Wow. So... Despite being gone for so long, they said that the plane appeared to be in perfect working order. And so now the aircraft is just sitting on the runway. Its engines were cut. It it stopped running its engines. Now it's just sitting there. So they're like waiting for somebody to come out, right? Yeah, right. Like you would be. Like, Like, what what are we still wondering? Like, what what the heck's going on? No one comes out. So they walk up to the door and they knock on the door. Like, hello, you know, come out. Nothing. They wait a few seconds. They knock on the door again. No answer. Nothing. The radio tower is still calling to the aircraft. Identify yourself. You know, this is blah, blah, blah. So I guess one of the guys looks at the other ones like, you got to get a crowbar in here. We got to pry this door. Open. We got to find out what's going on, who this is. Yeah. Why are they here? So they pry the door open. New plane. Who this? And when they look inside, all of the passengers, as well as all of the crew members were still on board. However, they weren't living. There was just skeletons. Sitting Come in their seats, on now. row after row. Even the captain, who was named Miguel Victor Curry, they say was a skeleton with his hands still gripping the flight controls. So how did this happen? How did the plane appear out of nowhere? How did the plane circle the airport numerous times? And, and how the heck did the thing make a perfect landing if everybody's dead on board? Now, instantly, the Brazilian government says, what about trying to cover the whole thing up? And many researchers began looking into the event. Uh, One researcher was named Dr. Celso Atello, and he believed that the plane clearly demonstrated a case of a wormhole or a portal or time warp of some kind. Even a retired physics uh, professor, a guy named Rodrigo de Manja, complained about the government's lack of transparency. He stated that the government had a duty to share what it had learned in the investigation. He even went on to say this. This is a quote. He says, the public has a right to know everything about this plane, and the government has a duty to tell them. If this plane did enter a time warp and there's any evidence to prove it, the entire world should be told something like this could change the way we view our world. And after science, uh, it it could alter science as we know it. It's a crime to keep this information like this a secret, especially from the relatives of the people who perished on Santiago Airlines Flight 513. So until this day, the Brazilian government has refused to offer up any more information about this case. Several people say that this is not true, that this is a hoax. It's kind of like a legend. like So we don't really know if it really happened. Uh, apparently, this is uh, for you conspiracy theorists. Apparently this happened and the Brazilian government knows about it and they covered it up and that they moved that airplane to some secret hangar and it's never seen the light of day since. Hmm. So did this really happen? Is this 
a story that's been like an urban legend that's been told over time and the truth of it has been stretched as time. Cause I mean, it seems fantastical. Oh, it seems insane. Right. It seems like a, like a classic ghost story, but like yet, there's no way this would be real. This is uh, a story that's told about in um, Brazilian folklore, I guess. It's kind of like but they're, they're claiming it's a real flight that went from Aachen, Germany to so, Santiago, Chile. If, let's just say it was real. Let's just say all of this is real and Brazil's found a way to cover this whole thing up and this whole thing. Right. It, this plane entered some kind of time warp. That's the only explanation. Because there's no way. It doesn't have enough fuel. Well, absolutely, right? And everyone's, I mean, and everyone's dead. So and they're it, just skeletons. It, it like, it not, went somewhere and then came back, but yet they were all dead and skeletonized, but there was enough fuel for so, the plane to circle and land, and then who landed it? It's not like a movie where there's perfect skeletons. Yeah. I'm assuming when they give that de- description that everyone's dead and has decayed because That's, they've been gone for three decades. Yeah, but you're right, and you and you read so many of these stories of planes having weird experiences, aerial phenomenon when flying through like the Bermuda Triangle. Um, I don't care if it's true or not; it sounds awesome. This plane actually apparently flew through the Bermuda Triangle. And there's lots of stories of planes. Remember, you've heard the stories of disappearing yeah, or having problem with their navigation controls. And then when they, all of a sudden the plane is reacting normal again. And now they're, they fast forwarded like 13 minutes. They noticed their watch yes. is wrong. Yes. I love those. I mean, this is another one of those tales. So did this thing disappear and then 30 years later came back? And uh, that's not the soundboard folks. That's my voice. Yeah. I don't know, but that's awesome. Just and, you making that sounds perfect. Um, so this is another, this is one of those bizarre stories. Um, Dude, that, I know I, I, all these stories, whether it's time slips, time warps, things like that. I know there's probably a really good chance that none of it's true, but for whatever reason, I love, it. I, I, I like the story. It's you. It, you. You read these stories of people going and then they're in a village in, in medieval France for like an hour I and love then they're it. back. But I, I love it too. Like, what is it about that? But we can't say that it's because we don't know. Like, that, what if there are, let's say, like we've talked about, it's not commonplace, but that it does happen. Uh, that it, because arche- stuff I mean, like that would explain missing people. Astronomers. I mean, mm-hmm. Carl Sagan and uh, guys like that, they, they, Lots of scientists theorize about wormholes, and they say it's definitely, it's most likely that wormholes exist. Man, that's a crazy story because it just raises so many questions. Yeah. I mean, like, how did it fly? How did it land? Like, say it, say it disappeared into a time warp. Everybody on, on board died, and then it reappeared. Why wouldn't the thing just crash into the ocean at that point? Yeah. I, I don't know. That's what, but that's what makes it an interesting story. I mean, I know there's going to be people out there that are like, man, you're reading fake stuff. You know, you get that all the yeah. time. You're like, well, yeah, that's what Expanded Perspectives is, is reading bizarre stories, yeah. odd tales and sightings. Um, I don't know. I like this one. I've never heard of it before. No, me either. Lots I of, really enjoy that. You know, that's another thing. I've talked about it before. Lots and of you're time, probably not going to hear a lot of stories like that. You know, people will always say, give us more time slips stories. And I've, I've mentioned this before. Yeah. Because there's usually there's only about 20 out there that I've seen. And every website's the same, one of those same 20. Yeah. I mean, unless you can get some from listeners, and we've had some sent yep, in, we've, we've just some. not, we need to go ahead, I guess, go through those. But like you said, is there's not a pile of, like this story, there won't be another one of those. Man, I, I hope not. But the most recent one is the missing plane, the Malaysian air flight yeah. plane. So what if 30 years from now that thing appears again and then lands Isn't there in a Perth, Australia or whatever? And It's out now that they did about that. Oh, I don't know. I remember following the case for for weeks. They would, yeah, found, yeah. I believe they found some of the wreckage. Yeah, they found some of the wreckage. But I mean, I know that there's like a television show out now. I believe I don't have TV. I just remember seeing it on like a YouTube ad or something along the lines of, hmm, what would it be? Like a plane vanishes and then reappears, something. But when it lands, everybody gets there and they're like, "What's the big deal?" You know, they, they were like, well, we went, you know, y'all was without radio communication for nine minutes on the plane. Yeah. But they land and they're like 15 years into the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're like, what? And they're like, y'all been missing for 15 years. Yeah, right. And they just landed. They're like, well, our watches are only nine minutes off, you know, of what this. So, I mean, yeah, it's. Or the famous case of the guy that, that landed and had a passport to a country that didn't exist. 
and stamps on from other countries that did exist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they put and, and they held him. People call hoax and they say that that whole story was made up. And yeah, there there may be a ton of these stories made up. We'll never know, or it may all be true. We don't know. Yeah, that's, that's why you're listening to this. Do you like cool stories? Guess what? We got them. Yeah, we exactly. got them. Anyway, that's pretty cool. You that's were telling a- me about. Uh, I remember you read the story of the woman that looked out her sliding glass window uh-huh. or sliding glass door. I'm sorry. And saw what appeared to be a giant sloth. And I had never heard of any sightings. And you were like, oh, yeah, there's lots of sightings of these things. Yeah. So you, you were going to come on today and, and share some of those sightings. Well, that's when I was telling you about the Seitochin or the Yukon Beaver Eater. The Yukon Beaver Eater. Now, that's a pretty cool name. Not as cool as Lycan Loop, but cool. Lycan, you're exactly. The Yukon Beaver Eater, folks. Carl Schuker reported on this, and he's talking about some stuff that ever was a report. Apparently, back in, in uh, late 1989, uh, that's when they were the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club. That's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, it was I guess they had just been formed uh, recently. And then so back in 1989, uh, a, a member of the Canadian First Nations people contacted this club and the, the person was named Dawn Charlie. And she said, Hey, that she is telling a story about this strange creature. This, what she said was a mysterious beast that is always passed on in the oral traditions of the people, uh, about the, the wildlife that's up in that part of the world. And, she referred to it as the Satochin, and the translation, their translation of it is beaver eater is what it is. And she said that it's bigger than a grizzly bear, that it's described as being bigger than even the biggest grizzly bear, huh. and that it feeds primarily eating upon beaver. And it says that this is the greatest story. You know how you get them? Like you don't imagine if you only ate beaver. They're not the easiest little creatures to get your hands on. They're out in the water. You know, it's like trying to capture otters. If you don't have a gun and you're just an animal, how are you going to go out there and get them? Yeah. This thing apparently would go out and wade out into the water and get the beaver dams, the little lodges that they build, Uh and just with both hands flip the tops over, just claws, rip the roofs off, and just start grabbing them out of their their little cave area that they built down there and just eating them. Now, the really interesting thing about it is... The description fits when they went and started talking to people. So they would, they actually went and interviewed Don Charlie, interviewed some other people about what they would think and the stories that they had heard about it on these oral traditions. And it sounded like the giant ground sloth is what they were describing. And this was a report. Now, listen to this. They interviewed Don Charlie, and she actually said, she said, this is a, a sighting. I guess that she had, but this is what she says. She said that it was a report taken from Violet Johnny, my husband's sister, who was fishing with her husband and her mother at the head of the Techon Lake four or five years ago. So this would have been in the mid-80s, okay? Okay. Says an animal came out of the woods, eight or nine feet high, bigger than a grizzly bear. It was the Satochin, and it was coming towards them. They panicked fired a few shots over its head, and finally managed to get the motor going. I'm supposing it's, of course, in the boat. And then they took off. Right. Goes on to say that there are other reports, and that there's a report that a white man shot one in a small lake in that area that the beaver eaters are supposed to live in. And apparently it's east of Frenchman Lake. There's a mountainous area in this bend of this lake they're talking about. Not Frenchman Lake, but east of that lake, the other lake. And what they're talking about is that mountainous region is known by the First Nations people to where the Satochin live, these beaver eater creatures live. So when, like we said, they start talking about it and they start asking around of what these were. It goes back into the giant, describe, the giant ground sloth. So you start looking at this thing. Now, I'm sure people, they're going off the idea of what trad- today's traditional sloth, a three-toed sloth, looks like, okay? Yeah. And how they how they move around. The giant ground sloth doesn't look like the, the, the sloths that we're used to seeing. But, I mean, they are big. Like, these things are very, very big. These... They're huge. You can pull up just pictures of Is a sloth, the, is, it, is it part of the rodent family, or is a sloth more of like a primate? 
Like what? That's a good question. I'm not sure even what you would put it in. I would probably say that it would have to be more of a rodent family. You know, like a giant tapir. Yeah. Yeah. Or what are the capybaras? Is that capybara? Those? those are like the biggest rats. Yeah, that's those yeah. things those anacondas like to eat. Yeah. So if you pull up like a giant ground sloth skeletons, you can see the size of these things. Like they're big. They're big. Oh, really? Critters. So they're like the size of like a rhino or something? Well, but they don't. They're bigger than a bear. I mean, yeah, when you pull them up and look at them, just pull up a, a, anything as far as like the the skeleton of them and you'll see how tall they really are. Like they're huge. So, I mean, like if you saw one, it wouldn't be like you're like, oh, yeah, you're like, no, that thing is a giant. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it now. Okay, you see it. Yeah. If you look at it too, you have to imagine this. It's not tall and thin. It's tall and massive. Like it may weigh a yeah. thousand pounds or better. I yeah, mean, this is not. It's got big hips. And, and it doesn't gonna, even look like a sloth. Like no, a sloth, sloth no. like like a three toed sloth, looks like a primate, right? A yeah. really small, yeah. moving primate. This does not look like that. No, to that's me, what I was getting at. Is it doesn't look like anything of it. It looks like a giant tapir. Yeah, because the way its nose and face is built. You know what else it looks like? It looks like it has the face of a bear. Yeah, I'm so I'm looking at a skeleton, and this woman is standing by it. I mean, and it's it looks about sixteen feet tall. Yeah, it's a solid twelve feet tall, easy. But do you see what I'm talking about? Is it's just big and barrelsome. It's got big hips, a big butt, big leg area, a big tail. They know they had big long tails on them. Yeah. So they stand up like what I imagine is a bigger, beefier version of like a kangaroo. Kind of the way it's built, except it's got longer arms, of course, and no pouch. So you look at something like this, it. You're not going to mistake oh. that for anything else. I was looking at this article, and uh, they went extinct only 2600 BC. Yeah. So that's not that long ago at all. No, it's not. Some scientists even believe that we only miss seeing them by like a few hundred years. See, so now this is uh, this is changing my whole outlook. So this is starting to be more this like- This isn't something that died off 30,000 years ago. This is something that died off literally just around the corner. Well, this is, I was going to say, this is starting to remind me- of like the thylacine and the like woolly it mammoth seems likely that people may actually be seeing it this reminds me of the mammoth of people reporting mammoth sightings some back in the day years after they thought they were gone it's like mammoths died out what eleven thousand years ago in siberia remember yeah. that up they to like what was it? Some like, believe even eight thousand years ago. That ma- well, they already say that the mammoth was still alive on certain islands. Whenever the, what they believe now is the time that the pyramids were built. Yeah, but of course, we all know they were probably built much older, much earlier than that. So of course they were alive. But there were other reports too that came out of New Zealand. Apparently, there was a fella wrote a book called uh, the fella Robin Jenkins wrote a book called New Zealand Mysteries back in 1970. And the sailors on a ship down there reported this. And this is what it says. Even more bizarre was a story reported to the collector of customs in Sydney when the Sydney packet returned home in 1831. One of the ship's gangs, which had been stationed at Dusky Sound, told of the discovery of an enormous animal of the kangaroo species. Huh. So like I told you what I thought it looked like. Now get a look of this. The men had been boating in a cove in some quiet part of the inlet where the rocks shelled from the water's edge up to a bush line. Looking up, they saw a strange animal perching at the edge of the bush, nibbling the foliage. It stood on its hind legs and the lower part of its body curving into a thick pointed tail. And when they took note of the height, it reached against the trees, allowing five foot for the tail. Now buckle up for this, buttercup. They estimated it stood nearly 30 feet in height. Holy cow. Now, I'm going to call BS instantly because you're looking up. Yeah. You can't see how low it is. 30 feet. Look, that's a, I mean, I would have to ask you right now to look it up because I'm not even sure how tall a giraffe is, but it ain't 30 feet tall. No. I mean, 30, what's the average height of a utility pole? 28 feet? Yeah. 25 feet? So you're talking a utility pole out beside your house. Okay. According to Google, northern giraffes are between 15 and 20 feet tall. So 10 foot tall. If it's 15, double that. Yeah, that's pretty tall. That's a ridiculous size. But anyway, so that's what they they estimated it as. It says that the men were to windward of uh, the men were to windward of the animal and were able to watch it feeding for some time before it spotted them. So I'm guessing that means upwind from them or downwind. Maybe they watched it pull down on a heavy branch with comparative ease, turn it over and tilt it up to reach the leaves it wanted. 
When it finally saw them, the animal stood watching the men for a short time, then made one almighty leap from the edge of the bush towards the water's edge. There it landed on all fours, but immediately stood erect before making another great leap into the water. The men were able to measure the first jump and found it covered 20 yards. Mm. They watched the animal plow its way down the sound at tremendous speed. It's wake extending from one side of the sound to the other says here again, one is tempted to think the rum was talking and for an Australian going away from home for months on end, what other animal would stir the imagination, but a kangaroo, but how much more romantic to think that perhaps they really had seen some prehistoric animal living out its days in the remote fastness of the West coast sounds. But when you start listening to stories or reading rather of these stories like that, like what Shuker and first of all, Carl Shuker is an amazing. Uh, he does the best research as far as finding the craziest yeah, I mean, stuff um, ever. Years ago, when we were gonna when we first started the show, I remember we were I was speaking to him to have had him coming on, and he had to get some kind of laser eye surgery, some kind of eye surgery. It was right after his mother passed away. I and believe, he was, wasn't it? Like it was something like it wasn't like there. just like LASIK or something. Like it was pretty major. Yeah. So he told me he would not be able to do anything for like three or four months, and then I just kind of moved on. I never yeah. went back. We should maybe talk because what was the name of the book he did? Mirabilis. Yeah. Yeah. One of them. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. of them. Anyways, go ahead. So uh, there is several of these stories of, of course, you're going to think about finding them in uh, jungles, in areas. Of course, you're not going to think about finding them in San Diego, you know, something along those lines, right? Uh-huh. But you would think in the Amazon, but you're definitely not going to think about this. And this is what I'm going to read you to. You're going to get a kick out of this. See if this took, this was actually written in 1937, August 18th in Boonville, Indiana in the Hammond times of Hammond, Indiana is where it came from, but it took place in Boonville. It says a stranger who declined to identify himself strolled into the newspaper office here today and declared that the weird, mysterious beast whom screams and prowlings have terrified residents of the Ohio river Valley is simply a giant sloth. That's what he proclaimed. Hmm. Says the man said he and his uncle were returning home from Mexico two years ago with the sloth, which they had captured on a game hunting expedition. He said they lost it near Evansville and never had found a trace of it since. They caught one in Mexico? That's what he's claiming. And he said he was uncertain if it was two-toed or three-toed, but averred that sloths came in both varieties. When a sloth is hungry and frightened, he said, it will give a vent to blood-curdling shrieks and yells such as terrified River Valley residents have reported they have heard intermittently since Friday night, August 13th, 1937. My still question, at that time, Mrs. Ralph Dolph reported that she caught a fleeting glimpse of the animal and said it looked like an ape. Posses, according to the reports, are searching the river bottoms cautiously in hope of tracking the beast to its layers. Now it says that river folk said today that they had seen an empty circus truck in the vicinity and assumed that animal experts are endeavoring to capture the alleged monster also. Well, I love how they throw in a circus truck. You have to throw in a circus truck. You they have to say it looks that. like a giant monkey. Yeah. You go on this way. So with the statement of it looked like a, you know, an ape, a mm -hmm. circus truck, and screams, instantly now we're like, well, it's Bigfoot. Or, well, it's just an escaped monkey. And it very well could. My question is, how piss poor were circus handlers back in the day that they couldn't keep anything in its cage? This is the story, right? Things All got the loose time. Everywhere. That there was an escaped circus animal, or they were filming a movie and they just released the monkeys when they were done. Yeah, just cut them loose. I, I don't know. I know that. Um, I, don't, I don't buy it, dude. I don't buy enough of this stuff. That was causing them to get loose. It I seems also, like that's the go-to excuse, yeah, though. Anytime yeah. there's something wild found, it's like, oh, yeah, circus handler just lost it. This is the swamp gas of cryptozoology. You're, yeah, a circus right. truck. Yeah, that's right. what it is. A circus truck. That's all it is. Uh, uh, is there even a circus anymore? It isn't like Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Aren't they out of business? I, I think so. What was the one that used to come here to town? That we used Carson to and Barnes. Carson and Barnes. <laughs> that was it. Had it's the like, world's smallest giant and the world's tallest midget, and it was a normal-sized guy. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember they had the pony with like the fake horn and they tried to claim it was a unicorn. Yeah, but like, you couldn't get too close to it. Remember, they kept it out in a, in a pretty good little pen away from everybody. Like you were, could only get like 30 foot oh, from yeah, it yeah, to yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. you were like, 
That looks like a PVC horn, like somehow hot glued to a pony's remember, forehead. It was like the, the biggest joke. My dad would always make jokes about the Carson and Barn Circus. Always. <laughs> always. It was great. So, okay, we go into that, and I have covered this in the past. Mapangari. Mapangari is the name that they give this giant sloth-like creature down in the Amazon because it means the roaring animal or the fetid beast, but it means roaring animal. So I had talked about Mapangari two or three years uh-huh. ago yeah, I remember I remember on the show yeah. when we were doing cryptids from around the world. And there are tribes, of course, and yet again, I'm a sucker for this. I'm a sucker for when Native Americans tell me stories. I'm a sucker for whenever the Congolese, the Congo people down there tell me they've seen the giant uh, Mokele Mbembe. Mokele Mbembe, yeah. Now I'm a sucker for the Catatana tribe down in the Amazon. That's uh, Giovaldo Catatrana, a Caratana. Ca- yeah, let's say Caratana. We'll just go with that. Uh, apparently, when this thing was written, this is what this is what Geraldo was talking about. Or Ger- Giovaldo. All I can think of. Geraldo <laughs> River Ray, <laughs> that old man on my league. Yeah. Ah, that old man was so funny. Uh, he's still alive, barely, but he's still alive. That's what this old man I've known for years and years called Geraldo Rivera. And I think I've told you all that. Geraldo River Ray. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what he called it. So now when I see like Giovaldo, or I just go straight Givaldo or whatnot. <laughs> Geraldo River Ray. Who is that singer? Rico. Rico Suave. Suave, Rico Suave. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good song. That's, a, that's my jam. I need to download that. Okay, so Geraldo River Ray was a member of the Caratana <laughs> tribe. Yeah, yeah. And said that he had seen one. Uh, th- this is this is a report coming from back in the day. So I'm not exactly sure when this report came out. Whenever we're talking about years ago, but I'm going to guess a while back. So he's talking about at this time of the interview that he had seen one of these Mopangari while he was hunting in a jungle area near what his tribe actually referred to as the cave of the Mopangari. And he says it was coming toward the village and it was making what he said was big noise. He said it stopped when it got near him. Right? Yeah. And he said, now get a load of this. And I remember talking about this, but I didn't know it until I read it again. He, This is the animal that they said smelt so bad people would faint, would get dizzy from its odor. And they said not only did it excrete odor from its body, like out of its hair, Uh but when it would roar, it was like its guts were rotten, like the breath was coming out of this thing was horrible. Well, sloths don't eat animals. Sloth just like eats buds and they're not fast enough to catch an animal. No. So they're just eating like shoots and whatnot, kind of like a panda bear, right? That's sloth don't really eat rotten meat. So what is it that's, I mean, you ever eat a whole lot of lettuce and then smell like you've eaten rotten flesh? (laughs) No, you don't. Your body doesn't do that. But apparently the body of the Mopangari with his big belly. Now, Geraldo River Ray's father was named Lucas. Lucas Caratana. And Lucas even said, yeah, said my son got to smelling that thing when they got close and fell. And when he woke up, of course, it was gone. He was like, yeah, yeah. He goes, I remember that whole thing. He said, when he took me back down there, he said there was a path knocked in the trees and through all the vines and whatnot that looked like someone had rolled a boulder through it. Like it's just barreling its way down through there as it goes. Now, so I bring all this up again to ask you. Why does some of the accounts, the smell, the screams, what it visually looks like, sound like a Bigfoot, but physically it's not built like a Bigfoot? Right, yeah. So. Maybe there's um, giant sloths Could there in be giant grass? Could there be? I don't know. Why not? I don't know. I would just, I just don't see how they've stayed. It's as plausible as any other theory. It's Bigfoot. I mean, it, I guess, yeah. I mean, you have a very solid point. It's I mean, we're pl- talking yeah. about a a cryptozoology animal. I mean, yeah, there's all likelihood doesn't even exist. Of course, you can start throwing out where it exists. I mean, I, I well, think so. Well, like we've talked about, the name Fortiana comes from Charles Fort. And Charles yeah. Fort actually did some research into this and apparently charles fort is tied to the be one of the first people to think or to suggest that the giant ground sloths could have easily survived in south america and he would point more point to patagonia because patagonia was where there was a legend of what was called the blonde beast that came from patagonia i definitely think south america i mean have you patagonia is a beautiful place when people when people look at 
like a globe or a map. The, 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 the continents aren't in actual like ratio. They do it for convenience to, so you can put it yeah. night and eat. So yeah. like South America. So it fits on the page. Right. So it, the actual countries down there, like Brazil, is massive. Mm-hmm. And that Amazon forest is massive. There could literally be anything living in there. I mean, uh, I yeah. think scientists will even tell you that there, that there's 20% more insects and things that we don't even know about that are living in there. Yeah. Or plants and animals and things like that. So, I mean, the, the possibility of a known animal, such as a giant sloth, living in a small population in remote parts of the Amazon jungle? Absolutely. I believe that. Yeah. Absolutely. There's... There- <sighs> I just saw, you know, and then they migrate north. I just saw yesterday in the Hood County News, they had a report of a black panther sighting. Mm -hmm. And the fish and game said, oh, yeah, we know where she's at. She's been in this area for like six years. She's seen all over from Fossil Rim over there by Glen Rose Mm -hmm. to Granberry. And what mainstream scientists will tell you that black panthers don't exist in Texas. They can't, right? But Mike Mays. Has thousands of sightings. Yep. So this is an animal that we know is a living animal, and it's migrated all the way up here. Why couldn't an animal that they think is extinct, but is in fact extant, and migrates north up into California or Arizona, or even pockets of them left over in Florida? Yeah. I, mean, I don't I mean, know. Like you said, is it any crazier than some of the other theories that have come out? You're okay. Listen to this. Glenn Shepard Jr. is a, an American. Ethno biologist and anthropologist, and he's apparently down in Manis. Okay, okay, and he even goes forth to say he was like, "Man, I was an ex- extremely skeptical about this thing because he was studying this Mapangari. You've been hearing all these stories about it, right? Uh-huh. Dealing with the people down in the Amazon and all this stuff." And he said that was up until 1997, and he said because he was in. Uh, the Western Amazon in Peru, and I think it's like a Machinginga or whatnot is what he was talking about. It's the name of this area. But so he said he was down there doing these studies and was talking to local tribes people because that's the best way to find about the local flora and fauna yep. is talk to the local tribes people. Yet it's always dismissed. Yeah. And he said that uh, he was talking to one of the tribes members and he said every one of them that he talked to. Every tribal member that he would come into when he was talking about uh, these animals always brought up the story of, he said, something that lived in the real hilly, rough, forested areas in the area that they lived, in the territory that they lived in. So the real rough areas that people don't normally go, Uh they all talked about this, what they described was like this real scary creature that sounded almost sloth-like the way they described it. But what he said is, he said, what really changed his mind what really and he, there's even a quote saying the clincher that really blew me away is what he said when there was a member of the tribe just remarked very matter-of-factly to him one day that he had also seen a mapangari at the natural history museum in lima when he was in, in lima lima peru yeah yep and so of course what's dr shepherd do so he makes He's these contact notes. him yeah he makes these notes he goes there yeah he goes without saying a word to anybody he goes there and starts walking around looking and sure enough, he comes across a diorama in there. And in that diorama is the model of a giant ground sloth. Huh. So he was like, this must have been it. He even said, he's like, look, man, he goes, he, he says, he goes, this is what he believes. He goes, look, do we have an idea that maybe they're just embracing this idea and it's their mind? They're trying to keep it alive. Like they've been sure, told it was sure, out there. Sure. So they just say, hey, look, it's out there. What do you know? Because he, this is what his quote, he says, just because we know that mermaids and sirens are myths doesn't mean that manatees don't exist. That's right. Yeah. So that's kind of what he leans in is he's like, well, just because we know that maybe the Mopangari, this scary creature is not real, maybe it's not what it is, the way they describe it, doesn't mean that a giant ground sloth's not out there. That's right. Yeah. It just means that maybe the Mopangari is not real. Huh. So I'm going to tell you this to wrap it up with. From Ware County, Georgia. This is a this is a story sent in by a fellow named Henry. All right, a report. Uh huh. It says one autumn I caught sight of a large animal moving through the cypress trees of the swampy area that borders one of the fields I work. I live in Ware County, Georgia. I was working the field at the time and noticed the movement. 
It was late afternoon and still light out. The animal was huge. It was hairy and it walked on all fours, but I did see it rear up once. It reminded me of a black bear, but much larger and lighter in color. I was only about 200 yards away from it, but I still had a good look. I know for a fact that this was not a bear. I've seen black bears in the Okefenokee, and this didn't even look like one of those at all. I later saw a picture of an animal, a Mopangari, that's supposed to be a legend, and I swear that this is what I saw. Have you even heard of this animal? And he goes on to talking about this, that, that he said he hadn't seen this thing in forever, but he noticed that he went over in that area where he saw it. Right. Okay. Okay. After he had seen this yep. thing and said that the cypress trees in that area were tore up, like the bark peeled off, scratches in them, limbs pulled down, which goes back to what we talked about that the mm -hmm. Australians had seen, this thing pulling down limbs, eating out of trees, this whole deal. My question to you now is this, and you, I know you're not going to know, but this is my question. These broken trees that are attributed to Bigfoot, is it a giant sloth breaking trees over so it can reach what it wants to eat? Maybe. Is this thing that they're talking about, these giant creatures moving? Maybe the reason that you don't pick up Bigfoot tracks or maybe, I don't know, maybe this thing doesn't leave tracks like a Bigfoot. Maybe there is a Bigfoot out there. But maybe they're also both. Exactly. And they're still seeing these things, these creatures as well. Because if you read the stories of a Mopangari, it does look something like a Bigfoot, like a big hairy bipedal animal. But then when you dig more into it, it sounds more like the giant sloth. Yeah, man, that is so cool. I had no idea when you did that first story last week that there were lots of sightings There's, about these these uh, giant sloths. I had no idea there were so many. Well, not just that. I didn't know that there was as much uh, research into it. Like they, people had done, I'll give you a, for instance, real quick. There was one, there was a discovery made back in 1895 in January near the last Hope in the inlet in chile okay uh -huh. they were some guys in there and they found a cave they went into this cave and what they found they said was a large piece of skin and this skin was five feet long and three feet wide and they said that it was co uh, covered with coarse hair and pockmarked with these tough ossicles so i'm, I'm not even going to pretend i even know what the hell that thing is right <laughs> so it says that this skin they said was the skin of a yimish all right uh -huh. that's what they call so they, I guess, did a cross section of it, studied this whole thing. They, they found out that it was actually the skin of a giant ground sloth, was actually what had. See now, how would you find the skin yeah. of a giant ground sloth in a cave? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, um, I think it's very likely that there's small amount of them still living. Um, very cool. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, what do you got planned for the rest of your week? Uh, I'm gonna go get back after some more pigs. That sounds awesome. I'm filling, I'm filling freezers with with pork, and that's my game plan. I've got some other stuff I need to work on, but yeah, I'm gonna try to go be, get back after some hogs. We're going to another baseball tournament in Waco, Texas. If we don't get rained out, and also uh, I had an interesting thing happen to me last week. My wife, you know, she loves to explore science. She bought Jacob, Caleb, and Luke. Oh, I know exactly what this is gonna be. These praying mantis eggs. These are real live praying mantis eggs, right? It looks like a dirt dauber, like a wad of dirt. She showed them to me when I was over put when it they in, come in. I didn't even understand what it was. It looks like a half gallon of ice cream, the container with yeah. a screen on the top, right? Yeah. You put yeah, these yeah. things in. You don't know when you're supposed to keep them in a warm room, somewhere around 70 degrees. And in three to four weeks, they'll hatch, right? And then she's going to release them in the garden. Sounds awesome, right? But well, it's Luke not like 20 or 30 of them. No, that, no two to 4,000. Every egg sack. Yes. And how many egg sacks do you own? Like three. <laughs> so Luke would check on it all the time. You know, they're not, they're not there. Luke comes out of the bedroom the other day with the lid off and goes, yep, the praying mantis is hatched and they're coming out in droves in the living room. He just walks in holding them. <laughs> Caleb, Caleb doesn't like bugs. He sees it. He freaks. He's out. So we start trying to gather them all up. Luckily, a lot of them didn't get out. I think about 60 got out. And I've never seen baby praying mantises. They're very cute, really tiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're so we got them outside and we released them and all that. But still, for like the next three days, I could be sitting in my recliner and all of a sudden I'll feel something on my arm and I look 
It's a baby praying mantis. I've had six on me. So there's no telling how many are still in my house loose. So you won't have any flies in your house or any other bugs true, in your house. That's true. Yeah, they're gone. I like praying mantises. So if you want to do that, uh, just make sure you glue the lid on if you have little ones around. But that's it. Uh, if you have any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, you can email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com or you can call the show 817 945 3828. I hope everybody has a good week. Till next time, I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.